In this section of the chapter, we'll look a bit more in detail at map projections and terms. Here we see a representation of a map projection. This is a very simplified map projection, which basically represents a mathematical transformation between the geographic coordinates and, a plane, and plane coordinates, and that would be an example of a projected graticule. The map projection process involves defining irregular topography, that is the Earth's surface, using a datum, flattening that datum out through a series of geometrical transformations resulting in a map projection. Here's a way of representing that idea of taking the oblate ellipsoid surface, which is a way of representing uh, the Earth that is close to being accurate, and converting it into a geodetic latitude and longitude coordinate for small-scale mapping. In other words, we want to see a correspondence between the points on the globe and the points that result in the Earth's surface on the map. There are several important things that relate to the scale of how map projections are drawn. And that involves points and lines of tangency, equidistant maps, uh, the use of actual scale, as well as principal scale. As we look at this through examples, we'll see uh, that these factors, such as tangency, uh, equidistance, actual versus principal scale, affect the way that maps appear and affect appropriate use. Here's an example of scale factor. Scale factor represents the scale relationship between a point or an area on the generating globe versus the resulting map. And in this particular case, this is a, a Mercator map projection which is intended to draw latitude and longitude lines as being straight lines with right angles. The result of this is that we see a lot of distortion as we get further away from the equator. Further clo the closer we get to the North Pole, the more the distortion increases. South Pole, same story. Scale factor of one means that the representation at the equator is the closest to actual reality. As you get up to 60 degrees north, that scale factor is now two, which means that places appear to be twice as big at 60 degrees north as they do at the equator. One of the important map projection properties is the concept of completeness. And this is the ability of a map projection to show the entire Earth. We'll see a representation of that in a moment. Correspondence relations are also important, which is where we talk about point-to-point -point correspondence. In other words, a point on the map results in a point on the line. Continuity is an important factor as well, and it's impossible to draw a two-dimensional map of the Earth's surface without making continuity in some way. First of all, this is the concept of point-to-point -point correspondence. Here we see that the North Pole is represented on the map on the right as a line. That's a loss of point-to-point uh, -point co correspondence and a loss of continuity when you notice that 180 degrees west appears in two different parts of the map. In fact, they're the same particular, they're the same line, uh, yet they show up on different of the map. Map projections are distorted. There's no way around it. We're taking a three-dimensional globe, and we're trying to represent it in two dimensions. So we have several different categories of map projection distortion. Equivalence, conformality, equidistance, azimuthality. And then we have resulting compromise projections that attempt to mitigate and minimize project, the projection distortion in one or more categories. There are three types of flattenable surfaces which are quite common in terms of how we draw map projections. One is the planar, which is the one on the left. The second one is the conic. And the third one is the cylindrical. Another way to draw this is by looking at representing how we would project uh, from the center of the globe out to the surface onto three different surfaces. A planar projection results in a projection onto a flat surface. A cylindrical is a projection onto a cylinder. And when we unwrap that and pull it apart, we'll have straight latitude and longitude lines, but a lot of distortion of areas. A conic map is a good choice for drawing a mid-latitude location, where the goal is to have a map that represents areas as being uh, close to what they are in reality on the Earth's surface. The cylindrical projection uh, basically means that we're projecting again onto a cylinder. A cylindrical projection has a line of tangency. A line of tangency is where the generating globe rubs up against the cylinder, but it doesn't actually bisect the cylinder. So right along that line, the line of tangency would be the place where you would have the most accurate 
uh, mapping in terms of the scale of the map. So here's an example of two different types of cylindrical projections. The first one is a so-called true perspective central cylindrical projection. In other words, this just takes the, the, the projection process and it basically says we put a cylinder around the globe right at the equator. We're going to have a line of tangency and along that line we have a scale factor of one and we don't control the scale factor as we move out away from the equator. And the result is that at 60 degrees north you have a scale factor of two or areas are twice as big on the map as they would appear to be at the equator. Here we have another way to do it, which is to make a cylindrical projection where the parallels and meridians are still at right angles and they're still straight lines, but we mathematically essentially smash the areas together closer to the poles as a way of mitigating the differences in terms of, uh, of scale away from the equator. Here's another way that we can show the concept of equivalence. Equivalence would mean that an area anywhere on the map would represent an equal area anywhere on the globe. It's very difficult to actually maintain equivalence, though, in a map projection. And it's not possible to have a map projection that's truly conformal and a projection that's truly equivalent. Conformality basically means that uh, we have conformality in terms of the projection itself, and it results in a great deal of distortion of area, where we have, again, these latitude-longitude lines being straight and no mathematical changes made between the two. Despite the fact that this map results in a lot of distortion when you look at it at the global scale, at a local scale it can be highly accurate when you're uh, applying it simply to, to, a, to a simple local use like surveying, not that surveying is simple, but at a global scale, you can really see the, uh, the distortion at work. For example, the, the island of Greenland, in reality, is about the same size as the country of Saudi Arabia, whereas on this map, Greenland looks like it's bigger than South America. So that just shows you how the of those maps can actually be. Here's another way of representing this and the relationship between the generating globe and the Mercator conformal projection. Another way of looking at uh, maps is by looking at the resulting projection, in this case a conic map, that, that where we're looking at it from a hemispheric scale. So we have a cone that was placed over the globe, we unpeel it, and notice that rather than having straight latitude and longitude lines, in fact what we have are curved parallels and straight meridians. And that makes perfect sense if you think of, of, um, of projecting a globe out onto a cone. Another characteristic of maps can be equidistance. Equidistance is where we want distances to be consistent across a map, and some maps do manage to achieve this or something very close to it, but it's difficult to do. On the previous map where we saw the conic maps and we saw the, the cylindrical map, uh, we didn't see equidistance at work there because of the distortion as you would move away from that line of tangency or that central meridian. Another concept is azimuthality, which is where we can measure uh, true compass directions on a map on a scale of 0 to 360. In this projection, it's a compromise. A compromise projection attempts to typically uh, keep areas to be close to what they really are and make compromises on other aspects of the map. In this case, you can see the scale factor isn't too far off as you move away from the center of the map, uh, but there are some distortions that are inherent in this particular map projection. Much of this comes down to how you'll actually use the map. So the cylindrical map, we saw an example of a cylindrical map when we looked at the time zone map. A conic map, it's quite typical to use a conic, conic map to represent areas in the mid latitudes because they're good at holding areas to be true to what they really are on the globe. Planar maps we often see represented as polar maps because instead of having a line of tangency, they have a point of tangency. That point of tangency is going to be in the center of the planar map, and it's where uh, locations are accurate with the least amount of distortion. Another one of the map projection parameters we need to think about is the case. The case is how the projection surface touches the generating globe. And this is where we can take the concept of either a point of tangency or line of tangency where we have scale factors at one, those are the most accurate at the point or line of tangency, 
and they increase away from that point or line. But not all maps are made with simply one point or line of tangency. This diagram shows us two examples of maps that are made with, in this case, a planar projection with a point of tangency and a cylindrical projection with a line of tangency. But we can also see secant cases where we mathematically manipulate the concept of tangency, and in fact, it's not really a tangent line, it's a bisection, where we, for example, stick a cylinder uh, and it intersects with the globe, and it's a way of minimizing scale distortion. So here are a couple of examples in just a moment where we can see it at work with cylindrical projections and conic projections. Here are secant case projections in the case of a planar map with not in this case, this is a planar map, not with a point of tangency, but with a line of tangency. It's not really a line of tangency, it's a line of bisection where the globe is meeting up with that plane and it actually is bisecting the globe at the, near the location of the North Pole. In the case of the one on the right, this is a cylindrical map where we can see the result is that that cylinder has now cut into our generating globe. As a result, the lines of tangency near the equator are actually shrunken, so they're less than zero. So the scale factor is less than zero, and as you get away from the equator, then it increases from there. But it minimizes distortion as you get further from the equator, so that's why they're used often. You'll see examples of secant case uh, conic uh, maps being used in this class when we do thematic mapping because it's an effective way to represent the area of different parts of North America with a minimum amount of distortion in terms of the principle of maintaining area. Another thing that we can do with maps is adjust the aspect of the map. We don't have to place the cylinder around the globe in a cylindrical map uh, based on the north-south uh, aspect, what we call a normal aspect, we could do it with an east-west aspect, what we might call a transverse aspect. The universal transverse Mercator grid system is actually based on a map projection that does exactly like exactly that, as the name suggests. As we're looking at the Earth, it's important for us to remember a simple fact. Even though we have great technology and we have uh, now hundreds and hundreds of years of thinking about the size and shape of the Earth, we still don't know exactly how the Earth uh, is shaped or how it's changing over time. And so there's a whole field of study that at the shape of the Earth, and it's called geodesy. From that, we generate geoids, ellipsoids, and they result in horizontal datums. So recognize that the Earth, in fact, is not a perfect sphere. It's actually a bit of an oblong sphere called an ellipsoid. But it's not really a perfect ellipsoid either, so we can represent uh, the true shape of the Earth using different models that approximate and get very close to what reality is, and this affects the way that we draw maps. The reason the Earth is not a perfect sphere is that after 4.5 or 4.6 billion years of history, the centri centrifugal force has drawn uh, the axis of the Earth uh, in closer, meaning that at the equator, the Earth is about 12 kilometers in distance fatter around the middle than north to south. That's shown on this diagram right here that shows the basic uh, pushing of a centrifugal force against the, uh, the Earth uh, at the equator. Smaller force near the poles, greater at the equator. That results in an equatorial axis that is a little bit longer at the axis than it is at the pole, so 13 miles longer than the polar radius. I said 12 kilometers before, but that's not correct. It's actually 13 miles. So the equatorial axis is 13 miles long polar axis. As a result, we can then create ellipsoids that are meant to mimic this reality. And with satellite technology, we have a much greater ability to, um, to depict the Earth in its true, true shape. In 1984, the World Geodetic System uh, ellipsoid was released, and this still is an important uh, ellipsoid or datum in mapping. One of the other things that we do is we look at the deviations between an ellipsoid and a geoid. These are just two theoretical models of the shape and size of the Earth. And we're interested in seeing how these deviate over space and what is the impact of variations, for example, in gravity uh, on the shape and size of the Earth. As we shift between different horizontal datums that result from 
uh, from using different ellipsoids. We can see that changes in the datums over time, for example, the North American 1927 to the more North American 1983, uh, can mean that we can misappropriate space. We might be off by 500 meters or a kilometer or what have you uh, when we convert from one to the other. And this is called the datum shift. As you work with data in ArcGIS, you'll get used to looking at maps and different kinds of map projections and use different kinds of datums. And it's an important part of the mapping process because it'll, for one thing, help you understand the data that you're displaying on the screen, and for another, help you make better decisions about how you actually use the data and when it is understand, understood to be accurate versus when you might want to ask questions about the accuracy of locations on a map. And that concludes the slides for this lecture.